Everybody, thank you for being here, and uh, this is uh, my 24th year as your county executive to do this ceremony, and the first year, my predecessor, my mentor, my pal Dick Squires, is not with us, and uh, that's the bad part. The good part is you are now at the Richard E. Squires Veteran Cemetery in Atlanta County. Um, I want to give you a quick anecdote. The last commissioner's meeting, someone came specifically to ask why we named, renamed the cemetery after Dick Squires. Before she got it out of her mouth, one of the commissioners said, there wouldn't be a cemetery without Dick Squires. So in the category, if you can't please everybody, you're going to have to get over it. We couldn't have made a better decision naming this cemetery, who was really his baby. He was out here all the time. And, uh, you know, he sadly missed, but he will be fondly remembered. The before I introduce the uh, keynote speaker, just a few words. Danny and I, Frog, we all graduated around the same time. Danny was at Holy Spirit. We were at Atlantic City High School. And I can't help to think about the inequities of life and how unfair. They went into service. I went to college. They were the rules. And uh, you wonder how we could stand for something like that. How unfair. Oh, and by the way, after I got out of college, I was teaching school. Still exempt. How others fought and died for their country. Went to college. And by the way, not that I did because I didn't. But it gave me the opportunity to protest, to scream, yell against this country, which unfortunately is happening again now. Did you ever think you'd live long enough to see signs on college campuses, death to America? It's almost uh, unfathomable that something like that could occur, and it is. And we are what we are, and uh, I guess tolerance is the word. I got another word, but you know, this is a solemn ceremony, so we're not going to go into this. Danny and I, last time I saw him, we were going to a football game in Atlantic City. It was at the Boardwalk Bowl back in the day when they had football indoors, which, by the way, was the first indoor football game in America. 
and we were standing there looking for tickets and mickey mccullough sonny mccullough's father came over and said here take these so we went up and they were press tickets for those of you old enough i'm going to mention two names i turned to danny and i said dan i think i'm sitting next to pete retzlaff and he said i'm sitting next to sam huff so <laughs> that was quite a time that we had and uh this is just an extraordinary guy, extremely ex successful, and uh, uh, you wouldn't know it, but he was a better athlete than I was. <laughs> he was a standout performer at Holy Spirit and then went on to, uh, to Great Heights. And uh, for those of you that know S.D. Lauder, he was in charge. He was the CEO. So without further ado, my old pal, Dan Brestel. It, uh, it, didn't, it didn't be hard to be a better athlete than Dennis. It wasn't that hard. Um, uh, thank you, Dennis. It's, a, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here. Why I am, I don't know. Uh, but when uh, people ask me to describe and, and maybe relate some of the things that happened in my seven years in the Air Force as how it affected my civilian life, the obvious answers are leadership, responsibility, maturity. Uh, but for those with all, I see all the hats in the audience, for those who served, you know it's much more complicated than that. It's not always good times, it's not always bad times. See, I look at life like a mosaic. And like a mosaic, when every tile goes into that mosaic, so the certain moments, experiences, and decisions in your life sort of paint your own mosaic, paint your life, and that's the life you become. So today I'm going to share some of my experiences. You can decide whether they're good, bad, or indifferent. Uh, but I ask you to realize that I joined the military 57 years ago. Most days I don't remember what I had for breakfast, so if my memory's a little fuzzy, please bear with me. My military career started after Villanova. I went to Villanova University, graduated with a BS in economics, and decided I wanted to be a lawyer. I applied, accepted to Villanova Law School, and unfortunately couldn't come up with $1,500 for tuition, so I asked the law school if they would defer me to January which they did. Came home to work at my dad's gas station in Atlantic City. Three works, three weeks later, I was on a bus to Newark for my induction physical and probably made the most important decision of my life. Do I go in the military as a enlisted man in the army for two years or follow my brother's footstep and join the Air Force and serve for four? I obviously chose the latter. And after working on the beach as a lifeguard that whole summer, I went to officer's training school and in uh, Oakland, Oakland uh, or excuse me, San Antonio, Florida, San Antonio, Texas, and uh, was commissioned a second lieutenant in December of December 20th of 1967. I was married eight days later. Uh, my first assignment was the largest field Air Force base in the Azores, and really a nice tour. I mean, it was an accompanied tour. My wife joined me, and if you guys knew the rotation. The Air Force rotation at the time was two or three years in Europe, then two or three years in the US, and then over to Southeast Asia. So thinking we probably ex ex you know, weren't going to get assigned to Southeast Asia, we decided to start a family. We did that, and in 1968, I now you might call this unfortunately or fortunately, I won an award that was the Outstanding Transportation Officer in the Air Force. Nice award, got a little plaque, got a handshake from the base commander, and got offered my master's degree from the University of Tennessee, which at that time sounded good. The problem was, in the military back then, for every year you went to school, you owed them three years of active duty. So that means with the two-year program, I had six more years on top of my four years. Man, if I wanted to leave the service, I'd be 33 before I left the service. I just wasn't ready to make that commitment. A year goes by, my daughter's born, and I win the award again. Probably the only guy that ever won it two years in a row, unfortunately. This year, the same plaque, the same handshake, and this year, this time, it was the University of Illinois for a master's degree. And I thought I humbly turned them down, explaining why I didn't want to accept it. Do you guys remember Twix? It used to be before emails in the service, you get a Twix. Well, two weeks later, I got a Twix from the chief of staff of the Air Force saying, how, what a great job I'm doing, how life was, how, how I excelled in my job, et cetera, et cetera. 
but I had an attitude adjustment in a year in Vietnam would serve my attitude adjustment. I said, what? So maybe the moral of that story is to do a good job and to get sent to Vietnam. That's maybe good. Deposited my wife and daughter in Summers Point and was assigned to Benoit Air Base in charge of all airlift aircraft coming into country. So all the freedom flights, all the in-country aircraft. Um, I watched every day hundreds of frightened young kids coming into in-country. And I also watched jubilant, ecstatic young men leave country. And that's the way life was every day, thousands. We, we, we probably handled 165,000 people in two months. That's the number of people coming through. Uh, it was a relatively safe, compared to some of you guys and what you lived through in Vietnam, with the exception of the occasional mortar attacks and the sap sappers, it was pretty easy duty. It, uh, if you were in Vietnam, you realize that regulations and rules were sort of just suggestions. And that's what happened while you worked in the air base. Um, the normal rotation, you come in from country after spending a year in a country, and you go to the Air Force Base or the Army Base, and it takes about three days to process you out of the country. Your orders are cut, um, they clean you up, they shave, they shower, and three days later we put you on a flight and send you home. Well, I'm sitting at my desk, and one, I guess it was about 11 o'clock one Monday afternoon, this Air Force ca or Marine captain walks into my office and said, Lieutenant, I've been in country 14 months and I want to go home today. I said, that's impossible. I said, look, we'll get you a Jeep over the Army base, we'll process you, maybe Wednesday night, Thursday morning, we'll get you out. He said, no, Lieutenant, you don't understand, I want to go today. I said, well, I can't break all the rules. He said, wait a minute. So he walks out to his Jeep, comes back, and puts a case of steaks on my desk. <laughs> he said, what about this, Lieutenant? Can I get out today? I said, Captain, you're driving me crazy. It's cry. You can't do this. It's... He said, no, take one second. He walked back out, came back in, and put a case of frozen lobster tails on my desk. I said, can you make the 3 o'clock flight? <laughs> He showered in my barracks, and my buddies and I had surf and turf for a week. It was great. Half my, halfway through my tour, I was uh, asked to come down to Saigon, and I was going to be the aide to a two-star general named John Herring. Great guy. He ran all airlift aircraft throughout all Southeast Asia. And at, at that point, you know, it, the duty was easy, but the subject matter wasn't. Every morning, we went to the 7th Air Force briefing. And I remember, like yesterday, the briefing starts with kills. How many confirmed kills on both sides, both ours and our enemy? And the first week, it just struck me. I couldn't sleep. I kept talking that is, it, we're talking about killing people. And sadly, by the second week, third week, it became like I was watching Sports, sports Center. The numbers didn't mean anything. You were talking 200 for them, 18 for us five for them, 20 for us, and the numbers became irrelevant. You lost all sight and all humanity. This people you're talking about, and this is death and kill. There was a personal experience I had, which was really troubling. We had the duty to go to, uh, talk to, go to this French farm and talk to this farmer. So we choppered into his house, and they call it a farm, but if you can picture going with the wind, the plantation, the, the, the huge colonial house, the decks, gorgeous. And our job was to talk to him and his wife and his kids to leave because we could no longer secure that part of the country. So we sat on this beautiful deck. Thank God his two kids were in, in France um, studying. So it's just he and his wife. And when we explained the situation that you know, we couldn't protect him, he turned to us and said, you don't understand. My father's father started this farm. I was born here, I was raised here. Other than my time going back to France for schooling, I'm as much Vietnamese as anyone you'll ever meet. This is my home. I also employ over 100 people and they work from my farms. So I'm a native and nothing's gonna to happen to me. Fortunately, we were able to get his wife to go with us, so we took her back to Saigon. And most unfortunately, he was beheaded three days later in the same porch where we had our, our lunch. General Herring was in country for two years. He traveled. He was responsible all throughout Southeast Asia. 
So we would occasionally jump in this jet and we'd fly with to Hong Kong and Bangkok and Baguio. But there was one trip we took that had, and I remember it, I will remember it the rest of my life. The, we went into Taiwan simply to go buy some stereo equipment, just the two of us. And we landed and I got a call from the ambassador and he said the chief of staff of the Taiwanese Armed Forces would like to have dinner with you and, and the general. I said, we're here just to buy some, remember the big woofers and the wheel to wheel, the reel to reels, that's where they're by, that's all we wanted. I said, that's fine, but we had no clothes, we're in fatigues. So the ambassador said, no problem. Eight o'clock that morning, Taylor shows up by six o'clock that night, suit, tie, shirt, socks, shoes, we're off to dinner with the chief of staff and his four generals, Army, Navy, Marines and Air Force. We walk in and there's the general I saw and someone from the embassy who I later learned was the head of the CIA in the embassy, but that was a whole other story. Um, we walked in and there are these five generals, Chinese generals, Taiwanese generals. None are taller than five foot eight and none are lighter than 260 pounds, all with Fu Manchu mustaches. We go to sit down and be behind us are these four guys, which I thought were at least water pitchers, this clear liquid in these pictures, it turned out that, that it was the Chinese version of sake. So as soon as you took a sip, your glass was full. We sit down and the general said, could you make a presentation before we start the dinners? Um, general's fine. At that point, a curtain went back and there was a map of China with 50 dots on the map of China. And a young captain my age came out and presented a battle plan with the invasion of mainland China. I'm telling you, I'm 25 years old. We're having our butts maybe kicked in Vietnam, and these guys want to invade mainland China. And here's their concept. The concept was all of these 50 dots were major communication hubs. They were radio, they were television, they were, they were a, a telegraph, they were a telephone. And their premise is, at that time, 1971, no email, no cell phone, 1971, China was a, a, a country of peasants and farmers. And if they controlled communication, they could control the country. And what they were asking General Herring was to provide the C-130 aircraft to ferry all their paratroopers into the assault. I can tell you that uh, my friends and family are probably home watching the first episodes of All in the Family, and I'm listening to four very intent generals describe their plan and what their piece of the plan was to invade mainland China. It was uh, obviously something you don't forget. And in the of today's world with the controversy between China and Taiwan, you have to realize how close those ties are. Uh, but back to Saigon, obviously we went back to the Pentagon and then the general suggested that we don't, we don't do that. We don't want to start World War III. So I wanted to muster out. I had 10 months left in my assignment, and they told me that I would not, I'd be separated at the port. When I landed, I had a wife, a child, $100 in my pocket, and I'd be separated in San Francisco and be on my way. After two weeks, they called me back in and said, well, listen, we'd like you to be a regular officer. What's a regular officer? A regular officer is one who has the same commission as an Air Force Academy grad. And if you do that and guarantee us two more years, we'll give you a tour in Homestead Air Force Base. And I was bribed, I guess, but I accepted readily. What I didn't realize until I got a letter during Desert Storm when I was the president of Clinique is the day I left the service, I had a 25-year obligation. So you can imagine sitting at your desk in a cosmetic company saying, we don't need you anymore, Captain. You can be just miss me the duties. Um, the Air Force did a lot for me. There was a growing experience. Uh, obviously, someone in the Air Force wanted me to stay in. That award I told you I won in 67 and 68. I won it again in 72. Unfortunately, this time they offered me my law degree at the University of Miami, which by that time I was over the Air Force. I was done with it all. I was 28 years old. And I started my civilian life. I started with Johnson & Johnson in manufacturing operation and 1978 joined this little cosmetic company called Estee Lauder. We had three brands. We had Lauder, Clinique, and Arms. Uh, and I ended up staying 31 years there. And when I left, it was a, 16, a $6 billion company with 17 brands, including 
Bobby Brown and Mac and all you guys looking at me like I'm talking. Just think of Old Spice on steroids. It's, it's, it's women's cosmetics. Ladies here all know these names. So that's sort of it's a cap of my mosaic. I was very fortunate. I think it was an experience in hindsight that I never regretted. But when you live through it and the sacrifices you make, I think it's pretty significant. And I admire everyone here who did, did serve. And I wish them the, the best. Some of the people entombed here weren't as lucky. You know, if you talk about a mosaic, their mosaic was shattered and made too, much too early. So what I'd ask everyone here is to join me and millions of other Americans on a national moment of remembrance. That's every Memorial Day at 3 o'clock, no matter what you're doing, barbecue, beach, whatever you're doing. Just take one minute of silence and remember everybody who gave so much for this country. Thank you. Now I'd like to acknowledge the Squires family. Please come up. And we have uh, a simple award for you all, a remembrance. On behalf of Denny, uh, Herb Davis is behind me, who is our current chairman of the advisory board. If it wasn't for Dick Squires, we would have no advisory board. And we have 15 proud veterans that serve now, and they're doing one hell of a job. And if it wasn't for Denny, Dick Squires, we wouldn't be here. Thank you very much. God bless. Thank you. Dick didn't leave much for me to do, by the way, when I became <laughs> quick. On behalf of Richard Squire's family, you're both in body or in spirit. Wish to thank Atlanta County Executive Dennis Levinson and his administration for bestowing the greatest sacred honor of renaming Atlanta County Veterans Cemetery in his name. He envisioned this reverent, beautiful location and final resting place for all veterans and their families as a tribute and acknowledgement to all whom served our country. Although his administration spearheaded this endeavor, he would be the first to acknowledge, appreciate, respect all the many people involved, both past and present, that have taken part in creating and maintaining this beautiful cemetery of which can make all of Atlanta County proud. Thank you. Thank you. And now we're going to have the presentation, the memorial wreath.